But I took my time um, to read it. I was very careful about it. <laughs> you know, the it was released uh, right before the Easter holiday, so um, just before Good Friday and Easter holiday, and I'm Orthodox Christian actually, so our Easter was the next week, so I had a whole other week of, of uh, you know, Holy Week. So, so I, I took my time, I didn't want to rush it, I wanted to read it carefully, read it thoughtfully, and uh, come to the conclusion uh, that would be based on the facts, not based on uh, political affiliation. And it was very evident uh, to me from the, from the beginning that uh, people were rushing to conclusions on both sides of the aisle, to be frank, uh, because you had people making statements about it uh, within hours after it was released. And it's a long report. It's 448 pages. Um, volume one, uh, it has more um, Russians in it than there are characters in Game of Thrones. <laughs> So, uh, it takes a long time to get through that because you have to keep flipping back and forth to figure out who this person is and that person. So it can take a long time, but uh, I focused uh, most of my tweets and most of my comments on volume two. And uh, volume two, two uh, deals with obstruction of justice. And, uh, you know, I'll try to keep the intro brief and we'll have a chance to go back and forth with some questions. But in volume two, uh, Robert Mueller uh, very clearly identifies and analyzes a number of instances, several instances of obstruction of justice. And he identifies these instances and, and shows us all the elements. So he presents all the elements of obstruction of justice. Now, the DOJ, the Department of Justice, has a position that you can't indict a sitting president, and I agree with that position. I don't believe you can indict, criminally indict, a sitting president. I think that's what the founders believed. So, even though uh, Mueller presents all of these elements, he lists them, lists them in his findings and analysis, he doesn't come to any assessment because he says, well, we can't indict a sitting president. And he didn't think it would be right to leave an open indictment like that, to leave open charges like that without being able to actually go forward with an indictment and not give the president then also an opportunity to defend himself through the legal process because it would just be sitting there uh, during the president's tenure. So he really left it to Congress to come to a determination on these issues. And what I'll say is that in the Constitution, impeachment is a special form of indictment. It is not a criminal indictment. So we're not saying when we proceed with impeachment, if that were to happen, that we are charging the president with criminal accounts. It's, it's not about um, criminality. So even though Mueller's report makes clear that there are elements that meet criminal standard. That's not what impeachment is about. It's a, it's a finding that someone has violated the public trust. So the Constitution talks about uh, treason, bribery, and other high crimes and misdemeanors. And when you go back and look at what the framers of the Constitution said, and, and early American scholars, and even current American scholars, uh, they're pretty consistent on this, that high crimes and misdemeanors re refers not to specific statutory crimes. And in fact, when the Constitution was written, there were uh, basically no federal statutory crimes. The federal government wasn't really involved in criminal law. It was primarily uh, state governments and, and uh, local that would be more involved with criminality. But um, the Constitution says high crimes and misdemeanors, and our founders meant that as uh, someone who's violating the public trust, um, someone who's abusing power, uh, 
They even thought things like maladministration might be uh, impeachable. So someone just not doing their job very well. Now, I'm not sure I would take it that far. I think, uh, uh, I think there are problems with taking it that far, just someone being really bad at their job. Um, but clearly things that uh, violate the public trust are impeachable. Now, uh, when you impeach someone, it doesn't mean that the person is found guilty of, of what they're being impeached for. It goes to the Senate for a trial. So for example, uh, President Clinton was impeached, but he was found not guilty of those impeachable offenses in the Senate. Um, and, uh, you know, I wrestled with this issue quite a bit because to me the conduct was obviously impeachable. So then the question is, um, do you then move forward with impeachment proceedings? And my biggest concern, I, I thought about this for a long time, like I said, I spent a month reviewing, analyzing, thinking about it, and uh, I am concerned that we've gotten to the point where impeachment may never be used in any circumstance, and I think that is a greater risk than the risk that it will be used too often. Uh, when, when you have impeachable conduct, there are so many layers that will, uh, that need to be uh, moved through before you would actually remove someone from office. So uh, I think there are a lot of protections for someone like the president. You'd have to have a two-thirds majority in the Senate to convict someone, uh, which is a very high threshold to get to, especially in a very partisan environment. But I do think that it is uh, more dangerous for our country to allow a president to uh, mislead people, make things up. Uh, for example, in the Mueller report, again, I, I think that a lot of my colleagues haven't read it, um, a lot of people at home haven't read it, and I understand why that is, because you expect your representatives and senators to read and understand it. But, um, and as an example, in the Mueller report, he asked uh, uh, the White House counsel to create a false record. Um, things like that to, to basically mislead people about a statement he had made. Things like that, uh, to me, uh, reflect uh, incredible dishonesty and, and really uh, harm the office of the presidency. And I don't think that...